Okay, hi everyone. Uh, and welcome to a joint team, Centre for Energy and Environmental Markets and SPRI, uh, PVM Renewable Energy Engineering School Seminar. Uh, it's a somewhat unusual one perhaps. We actually have a lawyer uh, speaking today and on the question of governance of the national electricity market. Uh, an unusual topic, you might think, but also really perhaps the most critical one, really looking forward for the prospects and opportunities and challenges for renewables and other uh, clean and distributed energy technologies. Uh, often when a technology first arrives, it gets its own set of arrangements, a feed-in tariff or, um, uh, you know, particular uh, small, scheme, uh, small scheme renewable energy target arrangements. But what happens, of course, is as uh, technologies come through, uh, they inevitably have to just become part of and participate within the existing arrangements. And that's really where renewables now is. It's not uh, a small little bit of uh, disturbance on the side. It's front and centre of the challenges and opportunities going forward. So the more general set of governance arrangements is, uh, becomes more and more important. OK. Uh, Governance, what is it? A process for making important decisions, a sort of who does it and how and with what accountability uh, and so on. Uh, this governance review that's currently underway um, by the federal government was mandated under a set of changes which really commenced around 2008, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, you might look at the current electricity market arrangements and think what a great opportunity a governance review is to try and fix up some of the gaping gaps and problems there and if you took that m sort of framework you might be a little bit disappointed with what's come out so far. It's been a fairly constrained and let's almost say limited and modest review I think mm -hmm. in some regards. Uh, Seam made a submission which was led, uh, the work for Seam was led by Neil who's somewhere here, there he is, uh, but without doubt among the bunch of submissions to the initial issues paper and so on of course, most of the submissions of the usual, uh, what we call them, incumbents, rent seekers, uh, was an extraordinary amount of work from PIAC, uh, the Public Interest Advocacy Centre. And uh, our guest speaker, Penelope, I should just introduce her. She's uh, prior to entering academia, uh, now at University of Sydney, uh, practices as a solicitor in London and Beijing, specialising in global energy and infrastructure. Uh, she's recently completed her PhD in Comparative Renewable Energy Law and is now on staff at the University mm. of Sydney. And uh, we'll be speaking about the work she's been doing, which contributed to PIAC, perhaps more broadly, on this governance review. So uh, please join me in welcoming Penny. Thank you. Thank you for coming along to listen to a lawyer. I know that we're not normally the most exciting people to listen to, so I've tried to make an interesting from a non-lawyer's perspective as well. Um, a bit about me, I actually adopt a commercial perspective to energy and resources law, and that's because of my background. So my background is I'm a former project finance lawyer, um, which means we used to actually fund the projects and get them up to commercialisation stage. Um, and I've worked across Europe, I do a lot of work now in Africa um, and throughout Asia. So I've got a fairly diverse um, range of experience. Um, my particular focus at the moment is on renewable energy and also energy storage law, which is a really exciting area to be working in. Um, and if anyone is interested, I'm always very keen for cross-disciplinary um, collaborations, particularly with engineering and economics and public policy. Um, because as a lawyer, I'd like to think that my technical knowledge on energy is actually very good, um, but it can always be improved. And I think working with other people um, just makes it a bit more exciting. So what I'm going to be talking about today is just why is our current system of governance for the national electricity market so complicated? Why is it so difficult to understand? I'll then be taking you through the institutional governance structure of the national electricity market and then talking about some key issues that are emerging for consumers, both major energy users and also um, smaller kind of ma and pa consumers. Um, and also some legal issues. I'm not going to cover off everything I would love to talk about today because we'll be here till midnight, um, but I just want to give you a sense of some of the issues that we currently are focusing on 
um, in our research, but also some of the areas that the energy consumer advocates are focusing on. So where we all went wrong, to begin at the beginning, unfortunately, and the lawyers here are to blame, the whole fundamental problem with the national electricity market was established in 1900 with this fairly innocuous looking document. And it's actually the constitution. And in the constitution, um, what they did in section 51 is actually divvied up the powers between the Commonwealth government and the states. And so things like postal services, telegraphic services, telephonic services, railways, all went to the Commonwealth because they could see that they were going to be issues that would cross across state boundaries and where a national approach would be needed. Energy, however, was left off the list. People didn't envisage in 1900 that energy was actually going to be something where it would be interstate, um, subject of interstate trade and commerce and where we'd need a national approach. Now we do actually have some areas or heads of power in the constitution in section 51, which do actually give the Commonwealth some jurisdiction. So we've got the trade and commerce power um, as between states. The Commonwealth has power over foreign corporations and trading or financial corporations and any other matter referred to it. So what this actually means for us is that our fundamental basis for energy legislation in Australia is a mishmash between powers being held by the Commonwealth government and powers being held by the states. And that means that it automatically, from the outset, we have got an incredibly complicated um, legislative regime. So into this comes the national electricity market. Now the national electricity market was really formulated at a time when we were seeking to move from very vertically integrated state-owned monopolies into privatised corporations. We sought to unbundle them, so you hear about a lot of competition. So removing those vertical integrations um, and breaking it down into transmission and in some cases distribution, retail and generation. So the NEM was designed to facilitate interstate trade, to lower barriers to competition, to increase regulatory certainty and to improve productivity. Because you can imagine if you're actually a national or a participant who's trying to operate across more than one state, actually having different regulation in every state becomes incredibly complex and is actually very, very expensive. In fact, some of the studies that I've looked at overseas looking at comparative renewable energy law suggest that by having different regulation in different states can increase costs by up to 22% in some areas of law. So this is actually a really serious problem. And that was the rationale for the national electricity market. Into that environment, so that, that's the way in which we established the national electricity market. What we now have, and this is all not news to anyone I'm sure in this room, is we've got a rapidly changing energy sector. In fact, in the draft governance review, the panel actually say that they have never experienced a time of such rapid change as they are as we are now. So we've got increasing concern amongst both large consumers and also residential consumers about rapidly rising electricity prices. It's been a very, very big concern. It gets a lot of media attention and it's also a subject at which they will lobby politicians. We've got the shift from very carbon intensive electricity sources to less carbon intensive sources, so things like natural gas and renewables. You've got the growth in distributed generation, um, particularly in the form of PV solar cells. And the one that I'm really focused on in my research at the moment is the development and commercialization um, of grid scale and residential energy storage. And what that is going to mean for our current market structure. And I've previously argued in other forums and also overseas that actually I think that a lot of our particularly competition laws don't actually work in the context of energy storage being a multifunctional because it can do more than one function. It's not just a generation asset or a transmission asset or an ancillary services asset. It actually has multiple functions. And if you're going to commercialise that and to get financing for it, so with my background, you actually need to take those separate benefits and be able to take advantage of all of them rather than just saying, oh, it's a generation asset. That isn't going to work. So into this environment, we've got the NEM, which was designed in an era before any of this. We've also got 
a very complex structure in terms of governance documents. Now, I haven't actually listed them all here. And anyone who works in the sector knows that there is this vast interplay. So we've got the Australian Energy Markets Agreement, which actually sets up the relationship between the Commonwealth and the states in this area. Um, initially um, drafted in 2000, well agreed in 2004, last amended in 2013. Frustratingly for me, there are still issues that were not current in 2013 that were included in the 2013 draft. For example, they didn't change any of the names over and there are provisions which are no longer relevant that should have been scrapped, but anyway. Um, it's very hard to get documents agreed with consensus between the states and federal government. Um, and so you tend to get these kind of lowest common denominator, we won't make many changes, we'll keep it quite light and fluffy. Um, you've got the National Electricity Law. Now this is actually a schedule to the National Electricity South Australia Act of 1996. This actually establishes the obligations in the national electricity market. And we actually have um, other legislation, each other um, participating state in the NEM and at the Commonwealth level that actually applies application acts. So it takes the South Australian Act and says that piece of legislation applies in New South Wales. Who knows why we went to South Australia? Prize for guessing. Why do you think we chose South Australia as the jurisdiction? First place to give women the vote. <laughs> that would be nice. It was the easiest. Why do you think it was the easiest? I don't know. So th have they were the least offensive of all the players. <laughs> and the least likely to challenge and to cause problems. So the South Australians got the legislation. The view was held that actually if you went to a different state, they were more likely to try and meddle. Whereas the South Australians were much more likely to kind of do as they were told. Um, so I went to South Australia. We also have um, the National Energy Retail Law, which is another um, South Australian piece of legislation. So if you're ever looking for these pieces of legislation, which you may end up doing, you have to go to the South Australian government websites to look for them, rather than going to, say, the New South Wales or Commonwealth government websites. And then in addition to that, underneath um, the National Electricity Law and National Energy Retail Law, we've also got things like the NER, the NER, the NECF, um, the AMC Act, COAG EC Terms of Reference. So there's lots of acronyms in this area. So we've got things like um, the National Electricity Rules, the National Electricity Customer Framework, which is in fact, it now applies to more states than it did previously, but it wasn't applying across the board until very recently. Um, the COAG Energy Council Terms of Reference. You've got different powers given to each of the energy market institutions under different pieces of legislation. So for example, the Australian Energy Markets Commission has their own act in which they get given certain powers as a body corporate. And then into all of this, we need to think about, well, how does this all interact with the energy white paper as well? And one of the problems as a lawyer, as a lawyer, we like consistency. We like documents to agree with each other and we don't like to have conflicting um, issues in documents. Unfortunately, in this area, there are aspects of the Australian Energy Markets Agreement which actively conflicted, at least until very recently, with the COAG Energy Council's scope. For example, the COAG Energy Council's scope, when it was changed um, about 20 months ago, actually changed it and said, the focus of the COAG Energy Council, it removed the word resources, the resources now back in it, um, and said that is to deal with the abolition of the carbon tax. Now, one of the issues is that one of the objectives of the Australian Energy Markets Agreement is actually to deal with greenhouse gas emissions and address climate change. Now, how do those interact? Now, as a lawyer, I have to look at it and think, well, actually, which one trumps the other one? And there's a process for us doing that. But it is actually quite problematic having conflicting elements in different pieces of um, contract. And the first one is actually a contract. It's not actually um, law per se, it's not a piece of legislation, and other bits of legislation and delegated legislation. So this is what we're talking about. This is what our governance structure currently looks like for the national electricity market. You can see there that we've got a number of market institutions. So we've got the rule maker and market developer, developer which is the Australian Energy Markets Commission or the AMC. <laughs> You've got the regulator 
and the person who does kind of um, the rule implementation and enforcement, which is the Australian Energy Regulator, and you've got the system operator, the market operator, which is AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operator. So they're the institutions. Then at this central bit here, the COAG Energy Council is charged with setting the national energy strategy. Incredibly important body if it actually does its job. Um, so they're the ones who are meant to be setting the future strategy for energy policy and also fundamentally the basis for our laws in Australia. And then we've got a brand new institution over here, the Energy Consumers Australia, which were established on the 30th of January of this year, which have been set up to try and address some of the consumer issues that we're starting to see emerge. So I'll be talking about each of these institutions today and how they um, function or aspects where I think they could be reformed. So if you go, and I went to the COAG Energy Council website last night, and this is what you see if you look up governance. Now this bugs me because it has been exactly like this since March, probably since much earlier. Equally, if you go to the legislation section, you get the same message. Now they've actually made a few changes um, because when we started going into this governance review process, I stood up in a meeting and I said, you're not very transparent and I think it's a real problem. Um, I got feedback that that actually wasn't very appreciated. Um, but in fairness to them, they have in fact now changed. And one of the comments they said to me is, we didn't realise people were interested. And I thought, well, if people aren't interested in the way in which national energy policy is set, we have a real, really big problem in Australia. Um, so that's my personal gripe. I'll keep on at them to try and change it, but baby steps. Um, so the COAG Energy Council, to kind of begin at the largest institution or the most important institution, I think, first. Um, these have all the state and territory ministers in attendance, as well as the Commonwealth Minister and the New Zealand, the Minister from New Zealand. Frustratingly, as I've already said to you, resources is no longer meant to be in the scope of the council. When they amalgamated, they took the 21 COA councils down to eight. One of the things that they removed was they removed any reference to resources. Despite this, at every single COAG meeting, resources is a standing item on the agenda and the resources ministers still turn up. And actually they've just put resources into the terms of reference, which they didn't actually have for 18 months. So for 18 months, our national energy policy setter did not have publicly available either draft terms of reference or an actual terms of reference. And one of the issues in the governance review is we were being asked to evaluate the effectiveness of the COAG Energy Council in how well they were doing in governance, how effective they were being, and yet we didn't know what they were meant to be doing. I mean, it's just craziness. Um, however, we have now got terms of reference, so it has all been remedied. Um, but I just find it bizarre that that was allowed to occur. Um, most decisions in the COAG Energy Council are actually made by consensus. Um, and when we do have votes taken, it's, they're not made public and nor is the discussion behind it. You get a very brief communique generally out of the meeting. <coughs> Might be two or three pages if you're lucky, a few dot points. It doesn't give you a lot of detail. But one of the problems I do have is that when you have public ownership of assets and yet the, the states are meant to be voting to have a competitive market structure, now, if you're New South Wales and we still currently own the poles and wires and they're being asked to vote in COAG Energy Council for the national good, the national electricity market, there is a clear conflict of interest that a number of states have in respect of their assets and that is not adequately addressed. And so what you tend to get is you tend to get very, um, how would I phrase it? I don't think a number of the decisions made are very brave. I don't think they're necessarily as innovative as they could be. I think we get a lot of lowest common denominator decision making. And also a lot of the negotiation process occurs between high level bureaucrats behind closed doors. And this is actually what we call the standing council of officials. Now, nobody knows who the standing council of officials actually are. I'm sure you do if you actually regularly attend the meetings, but as an outsider, we don't know who they are. 
We don't know what their mandate is. We don't know what work they're delegated to undertake. And it's just problematic. From, it's, it's not transparent. And it's very difficult to hold people accountable when there was no terms of reference, we have all this work being referred and you don't know what it is. And one of the points that I made in the submission was in fact the COAG Energy Council in May, and some of this has now been changed, was actually significantly less transparent than a number of the other councils, a number of the other COAG councils. So um, you'll be looking at this and saying, oh well it's okay, the Industry and Skills Council is just as bad, and that's true. <laughs> the Federal Financial Relations Council, in fairness, doesn't even have a website, so you can kind of dismiss that. But when you look at this, you can see, as of May 2015, and as I say, some of these elements have now changed, we didn't have terms of reference for the council. Nobody knew their governance structure, wasn't published. The names, titles and contact details of the standing council officials, not published. The guidance or delegation issued, not published. We didn't even know what the advanced meeting dates were. I mean, and when you have no forward agendas or no work plans, it's very difficult for, for example, the energy consumer groups to know what they should be advocating on because they don't know what the topics are going to be coming up at future meetings. So we have had a few wins. Advanced meeting dates are now published. The terms of reference have been published. Um, and we are going to get more detail around work plans and forward agendas. Um, we still have a bit of a black hole in terms of the Standing Council of Officials. Um, some other jurisdictions or councils actually even publish their phone numbers so you can call them up and have a chat. Now, I'm not sure we want to go that far on the Energy Council, but transparency is actually a really quite serious issue here. One of the other things that is uniquely Australian um, is what we call the bifurcated structure um, as we move down into the actual market institutions. So what we actually have in Australia is this idea that there is a bifurcation or separation between the rulemaking body, so the AMC, and the regulator is uniquely Australian. <coughs> this structure hasn't been adopted in any comparable market anywhere else in the world that we have been able to locate. So to give you some examples, I went through and did a bit of research and I found that in California, You've actually got those two roles shared between FERC and the California Public Utilities Commission. And in fact, the California Public Utilities Commission is kind of versatile enough that it also takes on the consumer um, advocacy role. And they're all done in separate departments, but they're done within the same body. In the UK, a lot of those roles are actually fulfilled by Ofgem. Um, the Gas and Electricity Markets Authority is the body that oversees Ofgem. So much of those roles are done by Ofgem. In New Zealand, the Electricity Authority fulfills both those roles. In Ontario, we have the Ontario Energy Board actually fulfilling all three roles. And if you go to Alberta, you've got those roles being largely fulfilled um, or shared between the Alberta Utilities Commission with the Market Surveillance Administrator undertaking kind of the enforcement and monitoring function. So, what we got in the draft report's response, and this was directly cited to the PIAC report, so it's in relation to the research I did, is they then said, it's curious to note that some stakeholders have suggested possible synergies from combining the rule maker and the rule enforcer. Now, I didn't think that that was a particularly controversial point of view, but clearly looking at this, it was. And the argument for why we have the bifurcation, if you actually do some research around this, there's not a lot of research explaining why we have it. Now, one of the reasons why we actually do have it, from what I can gather, is it was designed because we don't actually have any direct parliamentary oversight over the delegated legislation. So by splitting up the two roles, they were meant to provide a check and balance on each other. Now, that would work effectively if there was proper information sharing, and if we had processes that work, to a large extent, I think what we've actually now got is a system whereby we have the two institutions able to blame each other to a certain extent, and I'm not sure it actually works as effectively as it might otherwise. The other point that I would make here is that in a number of these jurisdictions, they've actually taken proactive steps over the last five to 10 years to consolidate rather than to create more institutions, which is the opposite approach to what has been taken in Australia. 
All right. Um, the next organisation or institution we need to talk about is the rulemaker. So the Australian Energy Markets Commission. So they're responsible for making the national electricity rules. So it's delegated responsibility. It falls underneath the national energy, uh, national electricity law. Um, very, very important role. And so we go through this process where, and I apologise for the colour scheme. The University of Sydney's got new templates. Very difficult to read, but this is an official branding. Um, but we, we go through this process. Um, now, this is a standard rule change process. You can see it would probably normally take around 26 weeks. The average time for a rule change, um, we did a survey, it takes about 29.55 weeks. Some rule change processes take over a year. Some take a lot less. But once they've made a final rule determination, that rule gets incorporated into the national electricity rules. Now, as a lawyer, the thing that's really controversial about this is that there is no parliamentary oversight of this delegated legislation. And this is the only area where we have this. In no other area do we have this process. Um, there is also capacity there for expedited and fast track rule changes. Um, they only get used in very prescribed circumstances. So, for example, if it's an emergency or if it's fairly non-controversial, um, they tend not to be used as much as we would probably like them to be used. Um, but they also exist just there for clarity. <coughs> so some of my most recent research has been doing a study into the rule change process and we looked at every rule change over the last two years. And what we actually found is that these are the entities who are most likely to make a submission or participate in the rule change process. And what you can actually see there is that they tend to be very large organisations who have dedicated teams to make submissions to participate in this process who are adequately resourced to do so. And one of the comments that we got from some of the energy consumer groups is we spend our whole lives putting in submissions and I actually had to say to them, well actually, compared to some of the other organisations, you aren't actually putting in as many submissions as you might think. And that's because you are more likely to put in submissions on topics that directly affect consumers, whereas other people um, will put in submissions on absolutely everything. So that's a breakdown of submissions received by entity type. So we had 35 rule changes over the last two years. Um, and that's the breakdown of submissions. Now, this is where it's going to get very controversial. Um, what we then did is we took out, of those 35 rule changes, we took out the nine rule changes where the consumer groups had made submissions. And I've got two graphs out of the nine. Not all of the graphs look like this, full disclosure. Some of them show that there's a much greater range. What the red and the blue indicate, so over on the far side here, we have the community groups. We then go into the corporate bodies that made submissions, government departments, and that can be either local government or state government. And it also includes, for example, can I get that one? That one there is actually the COAG Energy Council's working group for energy markets reform. And then as we go down, we move into the energy market institutions, so the AR and AMO, the retail groups, and then transmission distribution. Now, what this shows, we then went through every, each of their submissions. And we read every submission that was made in the last two years out of these nine rule changes. Very time consuming process, not a lot of fun. Wouldn't recommend it. And we classified each element of their submissions in terms of the final rule change to look at whether they, um, whether their kind of submission um, was adopted, rejected, or whether the AMC was neutral. Where we have groups like the Energy and Water Ombudsman in Victoria, where you can see that there is a gap here, that means that their submission contained nothing that was actually relevant to the final rule change determination. And that sometimes happens. Sometimes people put in stuff that's just not relevant. Um, but what this shows, so the red bars show that the final rule change determination disagreed with them and the blue suggests support. Now, as you can see, the closer you move into the industry, the more likely the rule change determination was to agree with your um, submission on cu customer access to information about their energy consumption. And what you can actually see here is that the 
approach adopted by um, the community groups, but also largely by government. And if you think about, if we don't have any kind of parliamentary oversight, and this is, these are submissions by individual government departments, and even the COAG Energy Council were meant to be setting the national energy policy, they're disagreeing with them 70% of the time. That's pretty striking. It makes you concerned about, has there been a degree of industry capture? Now, as I say, not every rule change is this striking, but to give you one that is even more striking, and I just picked out the first two out of the nine. They're not all this bad, in fairness. Check this one out. This is retail of price variations in member retail contracts. Now, the thing that's interesting about this one is if you go down, you think, oh, OK, it's not that bad. That one there, that red line is the major energy users. So it doesn't matter whether you're a residential kind of energy user who's represented by an energy consumer group or even the major energy users. Um, if you're an individual, um, what we found is you're very, very unlikely to have your submission in any part um, accepted in the final rule change determination. And the other thing that we have found, and it's possibly not so well represented here, um, is that also local government were more likely to agree with the submissions made by the energy consumer advocates. There was a closer synergy generally between their submissions than there was between the submissions made by state government departments and the consumers. And the reason why we think that is, is because individual state government departments don't unanswerable to the voting public. Whereas there might be a closer degree of nexus there with local government. But as I say, that's just a hypothesis. I have no effective way of testing that at the moment. If you have a great idea on how to do so, I'd love to hear from you. But um, this research will be published shortly. Um, look, in some areas, the AMC agrees with the consumers and disagrees with parts of the industry, but these are just the first two that I chose. So we've got some challenges for consumers. Now, one of the issues that I said is that consumers are putting in the number of submissions they might think they are. But part of the problem that we've got here is that actually participating in the submission process requires a significant degree of industry knowledge and also access to information that they may not have available. The other thing that we've found is that um, if you're proposing a rule change, one of the things you actually need to do is you actually need to identify how your proposed rule change is going to affect all of the stakeholders in the market. Now, if you're a small energy consumer advocate or if you're an individual and the individuals don't tend to get past go, um, you don't have the resources to do large scale quantitative economic data. And so what we've tended to find is that the energy consumer advocates will often rely on anecdotal data or will like to try and use surveys, which are actually much cheaper to administer. But if you actually read through all the submissions, you find that then you get the industry group saying, oh, that's just anecdotal. It doesn't actually reflect what we see going on in the industry. Um, you should ignore it. And so it appears to us that the AMC, and as it just appears, nothing personal, <laughs> um, <laughs> that quantitative economic data is given more weight, and you can understand it to a certain degree, but it does make it incredibly difficult for an energy consumer advocate when they don't have that access to resources. And also, if you're thinking about how it's gonna affect every single stakeholder that could possibly be affected by a rule change, that's a massive burden. The other issue we have is that there are commonly delays in the rule change process. Now that on the one hand can be great for consumers, it means that they're being consulted uh, consulted properly and that they're being given opportunities to talk but at the same time it can also mean that the rule change process actually can take a very long time particularly towards implementation and that can create issues. Um, I've already flagged with you that the delegated legislation is a real issue um, and that judicial review is actually very hard to um, get in terms of if either the AMC or the AAR make a determination that you don't agree with. It's actually quite difficult to get standing to then bring a, a, an appeal or apply for judicial review. Um, though we do actually have judicial review currently going on in terms of the New South Wales network pricing determination, um, which is very exciting. And I've got the court dates and venue if anyone wants to go and visit. It's a fun day out for all. 
Um, the Australian Energy Regulator is another one of these organisations, and I might just flick through some of these now because I'm starting to run short on time. One of my big ripes with the rule implementer and enforcer is that actually there haven't been a lot of enforcement actions and actually the penalties in terms of enforcement issued are actually tend to be quite low. It's normally you get about $20,000 for each violation, which if you're a big energy company is actually not that much, particularly because they, what they tend to get um, issued, the violations that tend to get issued penalty notices are for not providing emergency power to people who are vulnerable who need it. So for example, if you're on a life support system and your energy goes out, not reconnect it within specified timeframes. And $20,000 in the scope of that doesn't seem to be that um, effective for me. One of the big challenges we've had is we've currently got a debate about whether the Australian Energy Regulator should be separated from the ACCC, which is where it's currently located. Um, Rumour has it that this is all about the wages. I didn't realise this, but apparently there is a view that because the ACCC is subject to Commonwealth public servant um, wage caps, that that is keeping the wages in the Australian Energy Regulator artificially low. They would like to get more money and so they would like to be spun off. Um, as I say, that's near rumour, um, but that is what I've heard. We've also had discussion about whether we should be separating out the separate functions into yet more bodies. Um, personally, I think we don't need more institutions because each one of these institutions, if you're a consumer and you need to interact with the AMC, the AER and various other bodies, they actually all have different processes for interacting and different processes for FOIs, for judicial review. You're just adding complexity. We're actually making it harder for consumers. Um, the AER has also been doing a lot of work around trying to engage with consumers better. Um, query how well that has been going. Um, certainly the consumer groups appreciate the attention, but they do still feel like they're not entirely being listened to from what I can understand. Um, the Australian Energy Markets Operator. Um, these are, this is the institution that runs the market. There's an ownership split 60-40 between government and industry. Industry would actually like 100% ownership by industry. Um, there's a lot of debate at the moment about how or whether you know, industry should have a greater stake than government. Um, very controversial, happy to talk to you about that one at the end if anyone's really interested. Um, the one other thing I would flag is when AEMO did their own governance review in 2013, they famously sent it to the CAIG Energy Council before consulting with any stakeholders. So they did their own internal governance review, said, yeah, we think we're doing okay. And then they decided to consult with the stakeholders afterwards, at which point almost every stakeholder was furious. Um, probably not a great way of consulting. Um, sorry to flick through these, but um, one of the other big issues we've got is the National um, Energy Objective. Um, that's it there. Now, this is actually quite similar to um, energy objectives in countries like New Zealand. Um, quite similar to um, what they have in the UK. A couple of things though. One is that the interpretation has long been focused on efficient investment rather than the long-term interests of consumers. So it's a very narrow economic interpretation. There have been a lot of arguments about, and I've also made these arguments about, do we need to consider a broader national energy objective to think about things like to ensure competition, to ensure um, consumer protection? Do we need to think about environmental issues? How do we think about this? The other thing that is interesting about the National Energy Objective is that the wording in the American uh, Energy Objective is slightly different. Rather than focusing on the interests of consumers of energy, they focus on, which has been interpreted narrowly as the interests of consumers of energy in the national electricity market, theirs is in the public interest. And I think that in the era where we're seeing more energy storage and people potentially going off grid, that difference might emerge as quite a significant one going forward. Because there is a significant difference, and this is not just me being a lawyer and being kind of only retentive about language, because I get we can be, but the public interest is very different from the consumer interest in the national electricity market 
particularly in those isolated communities or those areas where we're talking about going off grid. So who are consumers? I think often when we think about consumers, we think about people like this lady. Um, but when we're talking about consumers, we're not just talking about small residential customers. Um, we're also talking about people like the major energy users are often just as frustrated with the current structure. And it's pretty striking that when you get the major energy users and these small consumers all saying the same thing, that then that voice isn't necessarily being listened to. Because then you think, well, in whose interest is this market operating? Is it operating in the long-term interest of consumers of energy when every kind of major consumer group from uh, individual residential customers to small businesses to large businesses is saying, we don't support this particular position and yet that's a position being adopted. Now, it may be in some circumstances that there are reliability or safety issues that need to be considered, <coughs> but not always. So what, oh, sorry. I obviously didn't finish that sentence. So what do the consumers want? The consumers want a seat at the table. They're sick of being consulted with. They say commonly, we were consulted with to death, but they don't listen to us. What we actually want is we actually want to be in the room when they're making the decisions, because it is the only way we're going to get our voice heard. There's a lot of um, kind of groundswell for a review of the NEO. And the governance review have said that that's outside of their scope. But people are saying, look, we want to think about what the NEO actually is saying, or at least how it's being interpreted. They want greater transparency, greater accountability. We want access to the documents so we can actually review them and hold these people accountable. If there is no effective parliamentary check or balance on the delegated legislation, I want to know what national energy policy is doing. I want to know what Australia's strategic vision is particularly when we're seeing significant differences emerge between what the COAG Energy Council is actually doing and the energy white paper. We're seeing a disconnect there. Um, we'd all obviously all like reduction in unnecessary complexity. That would be lovely. And consumers ultimately want affordable electricity <laughs> that reflects the true cost. So a movement towards cost reflective pricing, I think, is something that is going to be a significant push. Um, a lot of this work is being taken up by Energy Consumers Australia. They're a new body. Um, they're particularly focused on residential and small business consumers because the view has been that actually the major energy users can adequately represent themselves um, to a large degree and have the resources to do so. Um, this is the detail of the limited merits review. Um, thus far, apparently, it has been a corker. And I don't often say that about competition tribunal cases, because let's be honest, they can be quite dull. But apparently this has got to be, the last couple of days of hearings have been quite fiery. Um, so it might actually be a good one to go along to. Um, the Public Interest Advocacy Centre has actually brought a challenge on the basis on which, for example, the cost of debt has been calculated. And between the draft determination for New South Wales and the final determination, um, $2.3 billion of extra capital and operating expenses were slipped in. And PIAC saying, actually, no go. For example, the interest rate used in the draft determination off the top of my head was about 4.5%. In the final determination, it was 6.5%. And that's different from the figure used in South Australia, which is 4.5%. And people are starting to ask questions about how we calculate in these interest rates, because we've actually gone back and used a different period. And you know, interest rates are not actually state-based, um, even though the risks may be. Um, one other point just before I finish up, and I'll keep this very brief, is that this issue of federalism is actually quite a serious one. Um, Australian government, um, governments still own about 75% of network assets within the NEM. Um, and one of the other problems we're seeing is, and this is kind of some of the ownership structures, and this then affects all of the voting and the decision making in the COAG Energy Council, because you can imagine if anything is in public hands, they have a vested interest. And that is a serious problem for us. A further issue we've got, and I've kept this very brief because quite loyally, but um, there are a whole stack of areas that are still within state control. So even though we're meant to have a national electricity market, one of the problems we've got are things like feed-in tariffs, the application of the National Energy Customer Framework, consumer protections, environmental regulations. Quite a big one is actually energy efficiency standards 
are all still state-based. So you're actually seeing quite significant differences emerge between different states. Um, retail pricing, load shedding curtailment, um, authorizations and licensing are also often done at a state-based level. So these are some of the issues we're seeing emerge. These are some of the areas that we keep working in. Um, but that's all I wanted to say, really. Um, yeah, any questions? Oh, thank you so <laughs> much, Penelope. No Questions? Emily. Thank you. That was a fascinating insight. Um, I'm wondering, so you said like in Australia it's particularly hard for consumers to make submissions. Yes. How is it easier in other countries? So in other countries, if you are dealing with the same um, institution for the regulator, for the rule maker, as your consumer advocate, you're actually dealing with one body and you're dealing with one body, sorry. So for example here, um, in Ontario, we deal with one body. They have one very clear process for making submissions, for dealing with reviews. It's all very easy um, because you're not dealing with different... The problem in Australia is because we've got these different institutions, it's quite hard to figure out who does what, what legislation they're under, how you actually get freedom of information. And that information is not always available on their websites. But as a consumer group, you still wouldn't have the resources to do the, you know, the, the economic analysis you were talking about. It would still be anecdotal and such. Is yeah. that, does that have more weight in other countries? Um, I think there is some, a greater openness in some of the other jurisdictions to look at anecdotal evidence. But it's a problem that is spread throughout the kind of jurisdictions that we look at. It's a common problem. Uh, Graham. Um, you talked about some of the benefits of having more political oversight mm -hmm. of the rulemaking process, but isn't there a, a tension there in that maintaining reliability relies on certain technical constraints um, being respected and to insert politicians closer to the actual rulemaking process uh, and the politicians may have good intentions but may have no background at all in terms of actually being able to judge what could be changes that might um, cause reliability impacts. Uh, would you like to comment a little bit more on that one? I would argue that that is no different from things like telecommunications. So with ability to access mobile phones and reliability in those circumstances. And it's, it's the same in every... I work with 30 African governments and commonly I see that they are passing legislation that they don't understand. As with all of these things, you actually need to have ministers who are well informed. Often delegated legislation doesn't get overturned. It's actually very rare or it's very rare that it won't, it won't get passed. But it's just another check or balance on it um, that I think could be valuable. And look, there are certain politicians I wouldn't want touching the national electricity market. I think we can all think of a couple. Um, but it's kind of, it's, it's their job. And to have no parliamentary oversight is just unheard of with delegated legislation. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Tammy, for an extremely illuminating presentation. I'm just extrapolating from the first question about some international benchmarking. Mm -hmm. In your um, vast um, international experience and travels, um, have you come across a jurisdiction or jurisdictions that do this really well in terms of government structure generally? And I'm thinking particularly of um, uh, post-conflict states or, or countries that have had to start again in a way. So if you're, if you're approaching this as a blank page, how would you do it well? How I would do it well, if I was starting again, I would give the energy power to the Commonwealth, is how I would begin. I'd make it much, that, that would just make life easier for all concerned. Um, off the top of my head, most of the countries I work in have up to 18 to 30 blackouts a day, um, Liberia being one of them. So probably their energy infrastructure and their governance systems aren't there yet. Um, but the Europeans are doing some really interesting work on this at the moment. Um, and they've actually got um, a council of um, regulators who meet regularly. And they also have every year a consumer forum where it's actually um, they hold people accountable. So you make promises on your work stream on the previous year and then you have to report back on what you've actually had to do to implement it the following year. So there are some examples, particularly the Europeans seem quite good at this, um, even though their regulatory structure is also quite complicated. But 
Ours is just, yeah, very difficult. Yeah, I'm Darren Paslow, just an interested observer. Um, I disagree with you respectfully in that I'd be giving all the powers to the states like it was previously. Mm -hmm. And I worked for the Electricity Commission in the good old days and we had a beautiful network, everything ran nicely, all our consumers were happy and <laughs> we made lots of money and pumped prices it into... Prices were lower. The yep. Prices were lower, pumped it into this. <laughs> so the states ran it pretty well. When you look at the assets, generation, transmission and, and the consumers, and everything, they all sit in states. The little bit of stuff that goes across the boundaries, well, there, that happens. But that can be controlled a lot easier by interstate relationships because there's only a... New South Wales to Victoria link and a Victoria to South Australia link and a New South Wales to Queensland link rather than getting the feds involved. Get the feds out of it, get the poli federal politicians out of it, it would make life a lot easier. And if the states happen to have, can't get their act together to, you'd need a combining group to actually try and get things that work in the interest of everyone. But if, if they were different, it's not that big a concern to me. So I'm, I'm voting for it, put it with the state and get the feds completely out of it. Look, I agree. I think, I think when it was under state control, some things actually work significantly better. Um, I just think if I was designing a new system and I knew that there was going to be interaction between the different networks, and also the reason why generation is state-based is because they were historically state-owned monopolies, that wouldn't necessarily be the case if it was Commonwealth. We don't want a system like in Japan where you have two different networks operating on different voltages and they can't interact properly so I think I think if we we're going back to 1900 I would still advocate for the Commonwealth having it um, but I do take your point the states actually didn't do a bad job on a lot of these areas when it was under state control. Great. Uh, Penelope thank you a very clear exposition. Um, uh, can I uh, just make a, a, a point here and seek your comment that uh, Many of these, uh, what we've got here is a camel. Mm -hmm. This is, is it the horse designed by a committee. And, <laughs> and uh, one that you've raised is this issue of the um, uh, separation of AEMC and AER. Mm -hmm. Now before that, if I remember rightly, um, we had NECA, mm -hmm. which was a single body. And at the time, the, the market was emerging as a system that was <coughs> run by on a cooperative basis by the states with much resisted interference and diet desire to muscle in from the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, and and that that history I think is is really important but but the uh, the, the AEMC AER was in part a result trying to work in a cooperative manner among the states with little interference from the Commonwealth and concerned that the if you put the AEMC AER functions together, it would be just too cosy and it would be there would be a total lack of transparency. I, I take your point though about the um, unintended consequences of what uh, that has created, but uh, there's, there's a huge amount of history mm. often unwritten. And I think the often unwritten bit is an absolute shame because that's, if you're trying to research in these areas, it's actually very hard to get those informa that information and those sources of documents. So, can I, can I just mention another one? Because this has been close to my heart. Um, uh, people may know I used to be the state, the New South Wales energy regulator. That was in days when we did things really badly. Um, uh, I'd be the first to admit that. But um, uh, when the uh, wholesale market and the retail um, rules were being set up, one of the things that we introduced was the concept of an accredited service provider, where anyone who had the necessary accreditation could design distribution facilities and operate them and maintain them. And that, I believe, is still um, in the, the New South Wales statute books, uh, uh, so, so if I was accredited, I could actually do this stuff. But one of the things that, that the next thing I wanted to do, and I won that battle, but the next thing I wanted to do was metering. And I went to a, re, uh, a, uh, uh, a conference just recently on uh, competitive metering. 
and they're still talking about it. It's in, on their gunner list. Um, it's going to happen real soon now, I think is a technical term. Uh, and um, the papers I read actually were almost written 15 years ago, because I, I know I did it. Um, and we're still no further advanced, because everyone's acting out of self-interest. Please. Can't disagree. <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm sure there's more questions, but I think a horde of students might try and break this <laughs> theatre any minute now. Uh, I'll make just a few quick comments. Um, go and look at the governance review and the draft report. And as Penny flagged, it's extraordinary that it talks about these profound fundamental challenges, but proposes what looks to be fairly small tweaks. And I think we need a governance review, which I think Darren made the point, which asks the bigger question about fit for purpose. Mm. And uh, governance finds business as usual fairly straightforward. It's kind of just managed to do it. It's how governance arrangements deal with the big changes. That's the really key one. And if you want a clean energy future, I really don't think the current governance is there and able to deliver it. So yeah. we've got a really uh, big issue to address there. And some of what's going on here, which Penny picked up on, it's every time you change something, there's always a risk you make things worse, right? So let's think about pulling the AER out of the ACCC, well, maybe it's salaries. <laughs> but if you watch uh, Predators Hunt, <laughs> lines or something, and there's a herd, what do they do? They isolate one, right? Once you've got it isolated, easier to control. So you get a regulator that's just your regulator, you're halfway there to owning it and basically, uh, you know, capturing it. So there's some real issues here. And AEMO, 100% industry ownership. Not something the governance <laughs> review is saying is a good idea. No. You know, why do they want that? Pretty obvious, right? <laughs> so, well, very nervous. This review could actually make things worse. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's tidying up a few things. But uh, I want to make one more point. On your list of who made submissions, I didn't see universities there. Did we just not make the cutoff? At, uh, uh, into the AMC rule yeah. changes. Um, you didn't make the, so that was only the top, yeah. um, but you did, we do actually have submissions from universities, but not enough. Fine. If you're passionate about this area, write submissions. So that's one issue. But the other one I want to pick up on is the quantitative modelling. And people talked about, oh, the, they have the modelling. Anyone who does economic modelling knows how it's so prone to assumptions, <laughs> both in terms of data in and then the way that you treat it. It's a black box a lot of what gets done. It's a consultant's $50,000 a shot black box. One of the things we're doing here at the university with Seam and with Spree, working with Anna and Alistair and others, is trying to provide open access modelling tools wow. so that community groups can go run tariff, proposed tariff changes against 3,000 households, actual data, and see what the implications are. I think we can play a really important role in trying to provide tools which are far more transparent, mm. open, free to use, and uh, if that's of interest to you, please join us. That's uh, one of the things we're trying to do. Could you please join me in thanking Penelope? Thank you.